introduce you to our panel very briefly. Um, you, uh, we're lucky to have the filmmaker here, the producer and director of the film, Dr. Dave Jones. Um, Dr. Jones is now Dean of Pannonia Honors College. Sitting to his right, your left, is distinguished professor of English, Paula Cohen. Um, next is Sheldon Master, who was a member of Apple's first dedicated sales force and is currently president of Haddonfield Micro Associates Incorporated. The final member of our panel is John Gruber. John is a Drexel alumnus. He's joining us today. Um, he's also um, a successful writer and blogger. His website, Daring Fireball, sees around 4 million hits per month. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Dr. Young Woo Kim, um, Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Assistant Dean of Media Technologies. Dr. Kim, would you like to get us started? Thanks, Rob. Thank, let's thank the panel. So, um, as I was watching the film, I mean, it's, it's sort of this amazing snapshot of time of so many different things coming together. And uh, Drexel was really in a very, very different place um, before, I mean, at, at that time than we are now. So, I mean, well, first off, the Sixers have just won a championship, right? I mean, what the heck? When does that ever happen? So, so um, let's see. I, I, I wanted to ask a first question, maybe how the microcomputer project came together. And, I mean, maybe even from the sort of sales perspective, because I think, Sheldon, you were involved with the actual deal. And, by the way, I don't know if we need, are we going to pass the mic, or should we just kind of yell and scream? or? Okay, there's another mic right there. Great. Great. So I kind of want to see how the deal came together. I mean, this is, again, the context here, we take it for granted. You go to college, you bring your computer, right? That's just, just that's how it's done. And that certainly wasn't how it was in 1983. So making, putting the stake in the ground and saying, no, every incoming student is going to buy a computer. I don't care if you're an English major, I don't care if you're an engineering major. That was unheard of at the time. So that would obviously require a huge commitment from the university, and, and basically a, an enormous deal had to be brokered. So can you speak to that a little bit? I think what happened, Steve Jobs um, had an idea on how to sell a product, and he looked at the university level as a good avenue to start selling product. Um, I guess he interviewed a couple of colleges, and Drexel was the first to actually commit to the big volumes, and I think his rationale was, you have a student that uses a product for four years when they get out of college, and they start a business or they go in to work for another company, what product are they going to use? And I think that really launched Apple into the business market. And at that point in time, in 83, we, were, um, we weren't in the business market, we were in the educational market. So I think that was the rationale behind Apple going after the consortium market. And, and what was your role at the time? I was a regional rep. I handled the uh, state of Delaware, southern New Jersey, and southeastern PA. And, uh, I called on all the Apple dealers. So I was the, uh, everybody hated me. Because I could only, when Apple started, you know, the Mac started to ship, I was only allocated maybe two or three hundred a month. And I probably could have used about a thousand. So I would walk into a dealer location and say, you know, how many Macs do you need? And the dealer would say 100. I'd say, well, I can give you 20. <laughs> and he kicked me out of their office. <laughs> but uh, it was a total success. So I, I have to ask you about the price, because I, I happen to know that the original Macintosh was priced at $2,495. Mm -hmm. Was it really available to students for $1,000? Yeah. yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And the dealer cost, how much was the dealer cost? Sixteen hundred. I think it was around sixteen hundred and fifty dollars for the dealer cost. So Drexel students got it at forty or fifty percent off. The deal of the century for students. Yeah. Um, so and again, kind of in retrospect, this is kind of an incredibly forward looking moment for the university and the university administration. Um, I mean from the faculty, uh, both Paula and Dave, you were on campus at the time. Can you tell us a little bit about the build up? To the, to the project, what was kind of the reaction, what was kind of the mood from the faculty? <laughs> um, I was not particularly excited about it. <laughs> As an English professor, it seemed to me something, you know, extraneous to what I did. And uh, I felt 
that there was too much focus being put on the whole mechanism of things as opposed to, I mean, it was a tool, as I understood it, and it seemed to take over the campus. And there were workshops and special programs and this and that and the other, and if you didn't feel that you were involved in that, you thought you were going to be left behind. But I had a vague sense that it was all just a waste of time. Um, however, I will say, uh, I mean, I can't add very much to this being, you know, a, uh, not a technological person, but I have written many, many books, and I've written um, five novels, actually, and I don't think I would have written anything had I not had the computer. So, I mean, that's a very primitive use of the computer, I realize that, but the way I work is such, so much revision, that it would have been impossible to do um, in any other mode. So I'm very grateful for it for that reason. Well, I'm a classical late adapter, adopter, adopter. And so I would, really wasn't all that interested in the computer, but it was a lot of excitement around the campus. And that's what interested me. That's why I decided to see if Drexel would want to fund a film about it this. And that's one thing I do think was good. Even though I could care less about mandalism and music that, that, he, that we used in the film myself, I was, I, I liked what it was doing to the campus. It was energizing Drexel quite a bit. And I thought that was the most important thing and that's what interested me. Um, so this was 1983 leading into 1984. Um, can you say a little bit about what kind of impact the project had on campus after the unveiling, after maybe a year or two after, after the ball had gotten rolling? What was the mood? I mean, was it still like, oh gosh, we have this computer that we're supposed to use and we're not really trying to do it? Or, or had there been kind of, was there sort of a tipping point at which people kind of just accepted it or as, as a good thing and we can carry forward with it? I can't remember a tipping point. I do, in my memory, it did take a few years for some of us faculty to really get to the point where we used it a lot. And, but there was a point. I can remember talking with Paula, in fact, about how the, what's a big, what's the big deal about the web? Because there wasn't very much you could find out on it. There were just a few sites, but not very much. And then before you knew it, you were using email, you were searching the web for various things. So I don't know what, whether there was a tipping point or whether it was just gradual. But certainly by, after, I would say, 10 or 15 years, it just became integral, just like with Paul, who didn't, wasn't particularly interested in the computer, and yet she owes her ability to write all those novels to it. I think also there was, a, we were told at Drexel that we had to integrate the computer into every course. Remember across the curriculum. We were told, but that wasn't enforced. It wasn't enforced, but it was. <laughs> and I should also I know, the, I mean, how many of you here recognize William Hagerty, the president, the former president? Um, he was the president way back. How many presidents back is that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> maybe about five. Five or six. Between him and our, and uh, Papadakis, there were a few that didn't last very long. Right. But I, I don't know uh, how many. But I would say this. I don't know if this was what you're leading to. If you can put yourself back in that time, I really think that Hagerty, although he was, a lot of faculty didn't like him. He was a tough guy and uh, stern, sort of. And, but I think he did for Drexel of the time when he came in, something like what Papadakis did for Drexel later. If you think of sort of like a fractal image, you know, he took Drexel here to there, and then later Papadakis took it even further. I think his accomplishments are really quite impressive to me. That's, that's what I was going to say. Hagerty was a visionary, even though he seemed like you know, looking at him on screen, perhaps he seemed just like an old-fashioned kind of guy. Um, he took Drexel, I believe, from being an institute of technology to being a full-scale university. And then at the end of his career, his legacy was going to be the computer, the microcomputer. 
and he really saw it that way. That was the next step. He, you know, he retired how long after the computer? The next year. He retired, yes, I think uh, the next year and very shortly after the filming was done. In fact, when we were filming him walking around campus, he saw how jovial he was and positive he was. He had at that time terminal cancer. And yet he bore it very well, I thought. Um, John, well, let me get your perspective, John. I mean, you were a student here starting in, I think, 91. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So the, the microcomputer project um, obviously had taken hold and, and continued. What was it like coming on the campus? I mean, was that a factor in your decision to come to Drexel? Yeah, it, I mean, it definitely was. But now, it was clear, though, like, I majored in computer science. I mean, I've gone on and I have other interests, you know. But it was known to everybody I knew that was interested in anything vaguely that you might go to Drexel for. That if you went to Drexel, you had to get a uh, Mac. Uh, and for me, that was a huge draw because uh, my parents wouldn't buy me a computer. The first computer I ever had was when I came to Drexel as a freshman. And when I grew up, a lot of my friends weren't allowed to have computers because their parents said, I'm not going to waste that money. You don't, you're just going to play games and you don't want it. You know, it's going to be a waste of money. My parents wouldn't get me a computer because they said, if we buy you a computer, you're never going to leave the house. And it killed me. Uh, but they were right, I think. I mean, I played high school basketball. I had other interests. And I think if I had a computer in the house, I, I, I might never have left as a teenager. So in some sense, my parents might have right. But it, it was a huge draw to me to come to Drexel that, that they would use it. And then it wasn't just you'd get a computer and it would sit in your dorm room, but that it was supposedly integrated in a curriculum. So I guess 1991, to me, to start, is probably an interesting time because it's sort of the halfway point between 85 when, when this started and what I would say is the point where everybody had a computer, which is around 1995, 96, when the Internet exploded and all of a sudden everybody had email and everybody had the web, or if they didn't, three months from now they did. Because um, like I, I said earlier this evening that it was weird because we, in 1991, it's really hard to look back on it. Everybody, you're a freshman, you go over to the same building. It was very much like they pictured. You pick up your new Mac, you bring it back in your dorm room. But the only thing you plugged in was the power. There was no networking. Uh, Ethernet was like a $2,000 technology at the time. You know, there was no campus network. Your, you know, if you wanted to move something from one Mac to another, when I was a freshman, you put it on a floppy disk and you moved it over to the other machine. So that was definitely. A limiting factor, I think, of getting everybody engaged in the computers because it's networking in hindsight that makes everybody interested, not just people who are interested in computing for computing sake. But I will also say, too, I remember as a freshman that there was, and that's, you know, seven years later, six years later, um, there was definitely a lot of curriculum support for it. I remember getting, um, or you would be told to bring a blank floppy disk and you would get, um, like I remember in physics, there were programs that the you know that the faculty had created, specifically you know your problem sets and stuff. You could get on a floppy disk and go home, and you would work through them, and it would be ways of uh, you know just classic physics stuff, but you could animate it. So there'd be some kind of thing with a, a cannon shooting a ball, and you'd enter in the angles and the velocities and all this stuff, and you would see it. You know, I mean, it's the way that all sorts of software works. But I think even in 1991, that was unusual. Like, my wife is the exact same age as me. Uh, we went to college together. She went to Pitt, or at same, same time we went to Pitt, went to college. She went to college with a word processor. It was just a glorified typewriter with a two-line LCD display. So she could type a paper and revise it, like, two lines at a time, and then hit print before it would start printing out. But, but that was it. And I think that was very, very typical for college freshmen across the country in 1991. So I think you bring up a really interesting point that there is this, you know, it takes time for, for technologies to spread and, and for, uh, well, certainly for other institutions to have adopted this policy. But I also have a, another question kind of related to that. How much of the success of the project, and I think we can all agree that it was successful as a national model because everyone else is doing it now. How much of the success of the Drexel project seemed that it had to carry through about, you know, maybe five to ten years before everyone else was doing it. How much of that was dependent on this choice of the Macintosh? 
Now, again, the context here is, you know, you saw in the film, the Mac hadn't even been announced. They couldn't even say its name out loud, which was kind of, you know, an absurd moment of, of theater there in the, in, the, in the discussion session there. So Drexel is making this enormous bet on an unannounced computer that no one has seen, no one knows what software is going to be available. It's not compatible with anything that anybody else is using. And yet Drexel's making this huge bet. So I, I kind of want to put out those two things out there, just the, the stakes of this, but then also the, the machine itself. So um, Michelle, you were working for Apple at the time. Do you want to comment on that? It was a totally different uh, machine compared to a PC. Uh, it was more of a graphic type product. Um, it would fit more into uh, desktop publishing in a corporation. And people, when they looked, students, when they looked at the product, uh, you know, it was fun to use. It was kind of cute. It was kind of neat to play with. Uh, but the whole technology behind it, if you compare that unit to a PC, a PC is almost like rear-wheel rear drive, where you've got a drivetrain and you've got an operating system around the system, so you've got windows around the, you know, the product, and it's a lot slower. So the Mac was a lot quicker for calculations, for graphics, and things of that sort. And um, I guess it really fit well within Drexel because you guys bought a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so. Paula, how about, would you have written all those books if um, if the computer had not been a Mac, but say had been maybe you mean Because it would have been harder for me. Well, yes. well for everyone. Well, really. Yeah, I mean, I think it was easy to use. You know, I, I thought that was an inspired sequence in the film, which Dave set up, where we taught each other how to use the computer. And that actually did happen. I mean, I don't know how contrived it was. It wasn't that contrived. It wasn't that contrived. We really did do it that way. And the so fact sort of that, Sort of, I mean, it's a film, but um, it took us about 15, yeah. Well, it was contrived only in the sense that I scheduled, like, for when you were supposed to learn it. I mean, you really did learn it that way, and that's the way people were learning it, but I wanted to make sure I had a sequence of it. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, it was a, an easy, uh, it was an easy machine to learn, and I guess that wouldn't have been the case had it been a PC at that time. It was fast, even though I was I can't help but think that, especially for word processing, which at the time, pre-networking, I think was the one thing that unified everybody, because everybody has to write in, in the university. Teachers write, and students obviously have to write. And I, I can't help but think that the, that was the one area where, like, in 1985, the Mac was just so much further ahead than any other computer, where if you wanted to add an image in your paper, you just pasted the image, and what you saw on the screen was the image under the thing, and whereas every other word processor on the market at the time, you'd enter some kind of formatting code that would reference an image on the floppy disk, and it, it you know, WYSIWYG was an actual phenomenon at the time. What you see on screen is what you're going to get when you print. Um, and I can't help but think that for anybody who's non-technical, it was must have been a revelation because it you didn't have to understand how it worked. If you saw it, that's what you got. And oh well, well now I have I have images. And I do remember when when, when we were asked, do you remember do you recognize people? And I do not recall his name, but I did take his course, the very uh, obviously memorable character, the professor who had the eye patch. Yes. All right. So I, I, I took his course, and it was um, it was a humanities course. It was a history of Southeast Asia, and uh, I, I think in the movie he comes across as obviously almost you know he's clearly. I mean, you could just see before you he even opens his mouth, he's a bit curmudgeonly, um, and you think, well, there's the type of guy who's probably not going to jump on board with this. But I remember getting course material from him, you know, just. You know, like an eleven-page packet, like a reading. You know, the, the reading assignment for this week would be an eleven-page thing, and that clearly he had assembled in like MacRite or something like that. You know, and it had maps, and you know, it's nothing super fancy, but I think something that it, there's no way that how in the world would you prepare course material like that before the Macintosh? So, uh, and I have to thank the libraries for alerting me to this next question. Uh, 
During the movie, we see them actually trying to do a lot of research on the project. Students taking surveys, asking questions, how do you feel about the computer, or how, you know, and al almost doing, I mean, doing psychological research on this. One person brought up this uh, notion that Drexel's always been co-ed, and yet there had been kind of a steering of, um, of certain genders towards disciplines, specific disciplines. So um, at the time, was there actually, I mean, Obviously, this is sort of an absurd question for now, but at the time, was there this question or concern, will women use the computer differently than men, or will, will we have to design different applications or, or, or even utilize the computer in a different way based on gender? Was that a serious question? It never occurred to me. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it came up. If you notice in the film, some of the, all the women students are engineers. Mm -hmm. So Drexel was already... Uh, getting students, female students who wanted to be engineers, and they, they don't act as if there's something special about themselves. You know, here I am, a woman studying engineering, and I take it for granted. Right. So I don't recall any of that. It's true that Nesbitt was still, uh, what was it? Um, what was it? No. Homeback. Was it still called? Homeback. Homeback. I don't think they called it, did they call it Homeback then? I'm not sure. It didn't, it was certainly not the College of Media Arts. It was called Nesbitt, and it had, what was it, for, uh, Sid? It was Nesbitt. Nesbitt, but what, it, it wasn't, it was home economics and fashion, and More fashion, fashion merchandising. More fashion. Um, there were no media arts included there, but. No, there was some. It was there, called the College of Design Arts. Design Arts. And they had, you saw that group of artists sitting around talking about impregnation, whatever it was, <laughs> and talking, they were very, all very skeptical about the computer. That was, they were part of Nesbitt at the time. Yeah, the one who was doing the art was Bernie Brenner. I don't know if any of you remember Bernie Brenner on the computer, and he was an English professor, and he was a real 60s type, and I remember he had a course. What was that course? Where it, 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 the senior project was you could either write a paper or you could go into a deprivation tent. <laughs> that was your choice. Oh, a metaphorical thing. <laughs> that when, for a screening of the film that you actually got Steve Jobs to come to campus to view the film? Can you tell us a little bit well, about that? Well, I didn't get him to come, but Drexel did. The, uh, it, when I was editing the film, I already shot it, and uh, Drexel got a new president who wanted to see the film in Rough Cut, and so I had no idea if he was going to cancel it or do what. But he came over with Bernie Sagey, the provost who's in the film a lot, and they looked at it, and he said he liked it very much. The new president I didn't, didn't think I thought he might not because it's about you know something that he didn't have anything to do with. And it was his idea to have uh, have a gala Hollywood style premiere, all in fun, you know, with a big search line, a red carpet, and t black tie affair. And they invited Steve Jobs. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, that was the big wheels that did that. And I guess with the hopes of maybe getting more support from it. Uh, I don't know if he liked the film or not. I did, uh, there are some little jabs in there. You can get the Ike Goldberg bag for 25 bucks. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the Apple $100 bag. But uh, I met him and I liked him a lot. But he asked me, he said, they told me it cost this much and is that true? You know, so I think they must have been, you know, saying maybe you could do something for you. I don't know what. And I talked to him a bit about what the film cost. You know, it's tricky to judge the cost of a film because there's inside costs and outside costs. You know, you try to recover ongoing costs through a budget. Hard to explain. But at any rate, I talked to him. And he, you know, he was amazing. He was as charismatic and good looking and brilliant as everybody says. And so focused, so intense. But of course, I had no idea it was going to become what it became. He was only worth about thirty billion, so <laughs> small-time stuff. I mean. Sheldon, do you have, uh, from the other side, from the Apple perspective, do you know anything more about that event or any 
uh, backstory to that? I, we were in, uh, I guess we were in Mount Laurel at the time. No, we were in Cherry Hill. Mount Laurel. You were right. Mount Laurel. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, we uh, were in Cherry Hill. That's right. It was the rep firm. That's right. Exactly right. It, it was right. Uh, way back in the rep firm days. That's correct. I originally started. That man sitting right there got me into the business. He was the owner of CMS Marketing, one of the owners of CMS Marketing. We were a, a rep firm. And Sheldon has never let me forget it. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. I got a call one night at home, and it was Joe Ponarelli on the phone, and he wanted me to go in and interview for a position. I said, what is it for? He said, well, it's the App Apple rep firm. And I never sent my resume in. My wife, who's right there, has sent my resume in. And, um, I met them the next night and, and actually, you know, got the job. But um, Jobs was a unique individual. Uh, how can I say I hope he's resting in peace and he's in a better place, but a lot of people didn't like Steve Jobs. He was, you know, kind of arrogant. He knew what he wanted. My only exposure with Jobs was uh, we were in Hawaii. This was in 1983, and when we introduced the Mac, that's uh, before it actually hit the pavements and before Drexel got it. When you saw that commercial in 1984, it won't be like 1984 with a woman running up and throwing the sledgehammer. Uh, Steve Jobs did a presentation. Uh, Bill Gates got up and said 50% of his revenue is going to come from uh, Apple. And he was he was a nerd. He had you know glasses. His glasses were down, and he had plug pants and a shirt protector. And uh, I guess nerds really do rule the world. But um, he was up, Mitch Kapoor was up and uh, on the stage from Lotus, and that was a spreadsheet product that later, uh, you know, Bill Gates did Microsoft Office, and, and the rest is history. But at the end of the meeting, uh, we also had a laser show. The laser show was probably about $200,000 that they paid. And we probably all would have gone to Iraq and fought for uh, Apple at that point in time. It was, it was amazing. But at the end of the meeting, uh, I went into the urinal and I you know, had to go to the bathroom. And uh, I looked I look next to me and it was Steve Jobs in the urinal, urinal next to me. <laughs> I didn't know what to say and I figured I, I got to at least wash my hands and then I'll try to shake his hand. But at the end, I mean, I walked up to him and, and said, Steve, what, a, what an amazing meeting. This is, uh, this is unbelievable. You know, we're all excited. And he looked at me. And he turned away. <laughs> and he was always surrounded by an entourage of people. And he had his inner circle. And I mean, he, he's a genius. What he's done, what he did, uh, it's just amazing. But uh, that was my exposure to Steve Jobs in the urinal. <laughs> I, I would like to ask you a question. So, um, I, and I think the pricing, which I was not aware of, I, I think. When I got mine in 91, the discount was nowhere near as steep. It was definitely less than retail when we got our computers in 91. But it was not like this where, and I still think it's extraordinary, $2,500 retail, $1,600 wholesale, and then $1,000 to the student and faculty, which really, I think, you know, and you have to remember with inflation that $1,000 in 1983 was a lot more than $1,000 now. It's a lot to ask when you say everybody's got to get one. Um, and having just read the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs, and uh, clearly he's, you know, obviously he was a good businessman, maybe not as focused on the profit as Bill Gates, but, you know, and Apple is super, super profitable. But the Isaacson bio makes clear that Jobs was on the side of Apple that pushed for things like this, like, look, we're not going to make a profit on these 2,000, you know, 2,000 Macs in 1983 is great, that's a great, wow, that's a lot of Macs. But they're not making money on it because they're selling them at under cost. And then he got pushed out of Apple in 85. Did you notice, like, after that, that, that Apple's push towards pushing these machines into university situations was lessened? Because they weren't as interested in selling them under cost. Well, what happened at that point in time, you had all, you had, what year, 96, 94, whatever, had almost 10 years of uh, students learning the product and going into the workplace. And as a result of that, Apple got started to get launched in corporate America. Uh, and, and that launched Apple, the students buying the product. But you, know, you, you had said that 
they might have lost money at $1,000. I heard inside stories that the cost of the Mac was actually raw cost was about $255. But when you put R&D into it and all the other expenses, you're right, it, was, it probably was over $1,000. But it was brilliant to, to launch all these schools and kids went into the workplace. Yeah, so again, that moment in time, the production of the Macintosh coming to Drexel, starting this new project, and then you kind of line that timeline up with Steve Jobs' legacy at Apple, because he that was kind of his last hurrah for a while. He gets forced out, Apple goes through this other period. We remain at Drexel, of course, committed to the Macintosh for, actually, I don't, even, I don't know how long, when, when that, that didn't change for quite a while. It was still a Mac in your, in your time. It, I think it faded out towards the end of my, the mid-90s where they switched from, when I got there in 91, everybody had to have, ac quote, access to a Mac, which they wanted everybody to buy one, but if you didn't buy one, you could go to Corman and use it. But you had to have access to a Mac. And I think when I left in 90, when I graduated in 96, it was you had to have access to a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was controversy about that, I think. Right. There was an effort by some I think there was, do you remember this, that they wanted, some people wanted to keep, to uh, mandate the Mac, and then there was another contingent that didn't, and that latter group won, um, so that it became a matter of choice. But I don't know exactly when that happened, I guess in the mid-90s. Well, I mean, those are really the dark days for Apple, yeah. right? Apple is 30 days from bankrupt, or 90 days from bankrupt, wants to be removed. I think that um, was the consideration. Right, and so, you know, I, I, I mean, certainly I wasn't here at the time, but where I was, I was in graduate school on the West Coast, and yes, the, the idea that committing to entire university to a Macintosh was unheard of uh, at that time. Um, I want to change the topic a little bit to just more in terms of the impact of technology on education. Obviously, this was this was a forced change, right? This was the president of the university deciding that uh, we're going to do this and everyone's going to go along for the ride. Um, can you think of other examples or precedents or anything that comes to this level, or maybe just even at a smaller level, uh, where, where a new technology has really impacted education? And I'll, I'll use that broadly in terms of uh, teaching in the classroom, or doing research, or writing, uh, doing publications, and that sort of the scholarship. Maybe I'll start with you, Dave. You said large or small? Yeah, large or small. Well, I can remember that before the computer, I was amazed when I was doing my dissertation to discover the Selectric typewriter, which was a, <coughs> seemed like a magical machine at that time. I don't know if you remember that. It, it had a wall on which all the letters were, and somehow it was just a little computer in there. So whenever you, you typed A, and that little ball would, in a split second, uh, get A lined up so that it hit the paper, and then you could erase you could, with a kind of a white ribbon that was built into it as well. So from a regular typewriter to going to the selective typewriter was quite an advance. For, for people who had to write stuff. But of course, it only lasted a few years because of the computer. I think I'd have to go back to the printing press. <laughs> no, the reason why that's in my head, too, is because I, I'm i going to be interviewing tomorrow Umberto Eco. I don't know if any of you know his work. He wrote the novel, The Name of the Rose, and it deals with medieval monks who were scribes, who were, you know, the... Uh, repositories of the of literature before the printing press. I mean, they had to copy books. And so books were rare and precious and were only in monasteries where there were monks who could copy them. When you think about you know, the revolution that occurred when books became readily available, I think that the computer and the internet really ha has had a comparable effect on culture. I mean, I am kind of a backward sort of person, and I deal in words, so I would think that I wouldn't be so uh, affected by technology. But when I think of how the internet has affected my life, as well as the computer in terms of word processing, and the ability to correct and cut and paste and change in, a in an 
almost maniacal way. Um, I just think that it's it's of a, of a revolutionary quality unheard of. I mean, this is trite. It's been said by many people, but I, I think our world is, is just changing so rapidly because of it, we can't even foresee what will it will be like in the next decade because of the rapidity of the changes and the interconnections and the connectedness that's possible through the computer and the internet. So. Either you want to play it? Well, I, I would just say I remember that a big joke in the 90s was always about the that the computer was supposed to lead to the paperless office and had you know, that, that everybody gets these computers and then we can get rid of all the paper and that the truth was the opposite happened. Everybody had way, way more paper because it used to be in, when everybody had typewriters, you had to type a whole page to get one sheet out. Uh, and then with the, with the computer, you could just keep hitting Command P, Command P and keep printing and it was like everybody had their own photocopier, anybody who had access to a printer and you could just print more. Um, but I think it's taken a very long time to get there, but we actually are kind of getting there now. I was just talking, my son's too young to have homework, but I was just talking to a friend whose son is in sixth grade, and they get a, a wee bit of extra credit if they submit their homework electronically. Um, you know, and I, I think that, to me, is very interesting. I, I don't know. I, it seems like there's, there actually is, it's taken a long time to get there, and it lagged behind. People got the computers first, and then printed and print it and print it. And you can even see it in the in the film where the students' use of the computers got to a point, but then you had to print the archive. You had to print like a thing that was what you handed in, which was very similar, you know, and it's a continuation of what happened, you know, what you did before computers. You handed something in. Um, but I think we're getting past that then. I think that's interesting. That is interesting. Can I say something to that? Please. I think that's really interesting because I as a writer, I have to print out and read it, and then I make the corrections on the screen and work on it on the screen and print it out. And I can't imagine not printing it out. And I wonder, I mean, I, it just, it's, it's a back and forth motion, which may be a function of my age, because it looks different when it's printed, and I see things when it's printed that I don't see on the screen, and I wonder if that's not the case for a lot of people, I mean, for you, for your son, maybe. But um, if I don't do that step of printing it out, I end up with mistakes and with infelicities in the text that I miss, which may just be a function of where I'm coming from, from, you know, a printed out history. I don't, I don't know if anybody in the audience has any thoughts about that. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, despite all these things, almost going down. When you look at LCDs, um, Apple uses high quality displays, a lot of their displays are IPS or MPPA or PPPA, but even the uh, pixel density on a display is always going to be less than 300 dots per inch, so when you print something out, it does look nicer than it does look on a display. So you think so that's it? I think that's it, yeah. It's just a matter of it's looking nicer. <laughs> yeah, <but I'm laughs> I don't know. It's easier to read. I think it's about the fingering of it. I, I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. I think part of it could also be like the whole process of printing it out uh, is giving oh, you, sure. even though even if it's a very short break, a little bit of break from it. I think you're right. And, um, you know, you, you can edit it much better after having a little bit of a break. The break. Yeah. You know, um, that's, I was always told that when I was in, when I was in uh, school. And I was I came here to so I graduated in 2004. I went through uh, programs, we write, and that was always the advice we get to print it out and look at it. Yeah. You know, I, I've been paperless for years. I try to get my coworkers to not give me paper, yeah. and it's like a battle with some of them. And there's like an age divide. Someone's yeah. just 10 years older than me. It's like they always want to give me paper, and I'm like, just just email it or something. I don't want to see the piece of paper. I actually find editing written words digitally far more comfortable than printing it out and trying to do it. I mean, I remember in elementary school and middle school, I learned how to do all the little doohickeys on the paper and, and write it out, and, and I knew all the editing symbols, and, and 
once I didn't have to do that anymore, it was a big relief for me. And I, I haven't been owned a printer in, I think, 10 years. That's because I, I try to avoid it as much as possible. So maybe it is an age divide. I think it's an actually quite a personal thing. Yeah. I mean, right now I'm sitting here with notes on my yeah. iPad, and that's my little notes. So I don't, want to, sorry, I don't want to dominate the, question, the uh, discussion with these questions. We want to open it up to the audience before it gets too late as well. Do we have questions from the audience or the panelists? <coughs> Uh, one thing that struck me watching that video was how little has changed in the classroom uh, between then and now in terms of how much computers are used and what they're used for. It seems that today we still just have, they're just glorified projectors, mostly. And you know, sometimes we'll get an assignment that's presented on a course website. But it, it feels like we, we've made this very, very minor amount of progress in the last 20, 30 years. So what do you, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on the future of, of using technology in education and how we can do more with it to, to edge, you know, enhance the education process. Okay. So are you directing that question to any panelists in particular or just the whole panel? Uh, no, I'd be, I'd be interested in all of your questions. Okay. Same I, you know, I, if I need to write code, I'll write code. But I understand that that's, that's not an easy process and that's a, certainly a very time consuming process. So I think we are getting to the point where, um, you know, where you can do amazing things with uh, presentation software and, and animation and do things that, you know, would have taken weeks to code, you know, just a few years ago. So I think we're getting this, but I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be answering this question. There's a company by the name of Smart Technologies in K through 12, which we sell through K through 12 within my company and we sell higher ed. Smart has got all kinds of curriculum. Um, you can buy a piece of software for, you know, $29, uh, geography, whatever. What I don't see is in higher ed, the curriculum. Um, enhancement, it's got to come from within the school, and you've got to kind of develop your own, but I, I don't see a lot in schools. I mean, they use smart boards, but it's more or less it's teaching you know, the class, but it's not. I don't, get, I don't think there's as much curriculum software. Um, I'll insert a personal story about smart boards, because, and again, this is just my personal opinion. Uh, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a bunch of engineers from IBM, you know, pretty smart folks. There was a smart board in the room. We thought it was a whiteboard at first, so we tried to roll up right on it. That doesn't work. We couldn't figure out how to turn the thing on. <laughs> you know, I don't know how many PhDs were in the room. We couldn't figure out how to use the smart board, right? Which didn't make us feel very smart. But um, the, there is a real usability problem, I think, right. with technology as well. And, and the smart boards are, are really constraining unless you have prepackaged curriculum. And, and in that case, yeah, it works. K through 12 it works, but in higher ed, it's, it's yeah. much more difficult. Can I add a comment too on this campus? I think I was there to explore. I think the question is very well put as one to just raise that question. And what we're trying to do too on campus is to think about what factors affect your learning in your environment. So some of what we're doing here, believe not, this is a different technology. You can write on it. And I've seen ways that this has made such a difference in terms of freeing up people to just see things in a broader space than you can. Uh, there's you know, think of it as a, as a board to do it. And the other area, which is a huge difference in higher ed too, is distance learning. That is a very different kind of classroom environment. So I think it's, it's an exciting time now to make that connection, not just thinking about as a technology or as a classroom, but what does it take to help you learn in your environment? I, uh, with regard to the, maybe the difference between higher ed and K-12, is that I think K-12, I mean, and I, I'm not an educator, so I, I could be completely speaking out of my ass here, but that K-12, I think, is a lot more of a preset curriculum. And so that somebody can write an app or some kind of dynamic thing meant for like 11th and 12th grade physics students, and they can sell it across the whole country. Whereas I think in higher ed, it's a lot more personal. I mean, that is what I got out of college, is that when I took courses with Dave, it was Dave teaching me the history of Hitchcock. Um, yeah, I, I, I Hitchcock in uh, the West. What grade did you get? I got, I got, I bet you got it. I did get, I, it was some of my best, I bet as a computer science student, it was uh, my, you know, probably the only A's I got my senior year. No, I took two courses with Dave, and they were great, but I loved it. it just, uh, <coughs> Uh, you told me I use italics too frequently. But then you told me later in the term, you said, you know what, I kind of like the way you use italics. Um, 
we had a very good discussion about it. I, I, but, uh, but it was absolutely, it was not like a course on Hitchcock. It was Dave's course on Hitchcock. Uh, and I think that's the best of what college has to offer. And so I think one of the things that the whole computer industry has sort of lost since the 80s was making it easier for more people to be able to write their own software. So for an example that I, a specific example I remember, and I might be getting his name wrong, I'm not great with names, but he was, uh, and it, maybe he's still at Drexel, I don't know, is it, but I think he was the head of the math department. His name was, I think, Dr. Chris Reyes, Reyes, something like that. Big tall guy with dark hair. Great, great professor, I had for calculus, and he had written hyperpart specs. Now he was not a computer professor, he was a math professor, he was a mathematician, he was not a programmer. Now you can argue that someone who's a PhD in mathematics is more of a natural inclination towards programming than, say, an English professor, right? And that is true. So it's not like everybody was going to be writing their own stuff, but more people would. And his hyperpart stacks were great. I mean, and they really were pedagogical. They helped you learn, you know, in calculus, you know, if anybody has ever taken calculus, you know that it's these minor changes and you can, you can see them visually by graphing them. Um, and it wasn't something, I, you know, as far as I know, that maybe other, maybe he made them available to the other members of the Drexel faculty, but it wasn't mass produced. It was, you know, something that he had written and had revised over time and, and you know, could talk to you about and even change the way that it worked if you had questions. Um, and in the 80s and the 90s, the, that hyperpart was an example of this sort of thing where there was still this push to help somehow everybody program computers. And that's never going to be the case. But we've gotten away from that, I think. Like, like you know, iOS is obviously the biggest thing in computing today and, and apps, but writing apps for the iPhone and iPad and writing apps for Android is not, it's not for something anybody, it's not like a mass market thing. It's not like word processing. Like the idea then was there should be a way that, the way that anybody can make a word processing document that looks professional, you know, like really nice fonts and truly nice looking diagrams, that they should be able to write software too. And I, I don't even know if somebody said, what would I use for that today? I don't even know what that would be. We sort of have gotten away from that. Um, and I think that is the sort of thing that we would need to enable that. Something like a hypercard for the iPad, I think you could get a lot more of that sort of software in the higher ed. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, not so much a question, but going back to the original point of what has progressed or not progressed in the way of the use of computers over the last 20 or 30 years, I think that, that question needs to be looked at a little more closely because I think you have to look at both the issue of what has the computer done to the content of education within the classroom and what has computer in itself done to the process by which we provide the education. And uh, I've seen personally in the classroom the use of the computer as aiding in the process in, in many ways. For example, uh, students can work together without even physically having to be in the same room. There's virtual organizations which are made use of through the computer. There's the uh, actual the research that is available through the use of the internet on the computer, which I think has expedited the use of research in many courses. Uh, so I, I, I think there have been changes, but I don't think we want to look at it and just say, what has it done to uh, education without looking at both the process and the content of the education itself. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that in any way. I would say I'm carrying 80% less paper than I once carried. I mean, I felt like I was on campus uh, as the original bag lady with all the paper that you see carry around. But I don't do that anymore with the assignment Dropbox and all of the tools that are available. The one thing that I feel that is very important is that teacher-student relationship. 
and that as I'm bringing along my classes and I'm giving them uh, very intent attention, I think that there's more value there than no computer can substitute. I think we had two questions back here that are probably just the last two. Um, there was a, a moment in this when they were talking a lot about faculty development, what was, was going to make or break the success of, of this project. And, and there was the gentleman, the 65-year-old um, uh, accounting professor, who said, you know, for the first time in 30 years, he was asking the same questions he asked his first year, which was, how do I teach this information? How do I convey this? And I have to rethink that. And I was curious, you know, from your experience, to what extent when when these things came in and, and there was this energy on campus, this grand project, that, to what extent did you have to revisit how you conveyed this information and how you were thinking about it? And maybe the computer itself didn't become a part of that, but, but was there in any way this grand project that maybe forced everybody to start rethinking a lot of, of how they were delivering and how they were educating? Did that, you know, was, was that a part of what happened? Well, it sounds sure great. It I know that it was, it was Tom Canavan, I think. Tom Canavan, who was Dean of Arts and Sciences at that time, made that point that it wasn't so much about the computer itself, but the fact that the computer made people think again about education in a new way. I, I have to be honest, I'm not sure that I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I did either. In fact, I'm sure that I didn't at first. I, my thing, I would teach film. It's a different uh, subject. I think a lot of it's dependent on what you taught. There, my problem was finding a way to even use it. And, and when, this, when the computer came in, films were still, if I wanted to show a film, I had to show a 16 millimeter film. I needed a film projector. I, the computer would, was of no use to me. And uh, showing and, and teaching film, we, we had Super 8 film and then a little bit of 16 millimeter film. Was, I don't know if you had any you young people have ever seen it. A strip of plastic that you had to handle and cut and do all of that. So for me, it was very gradual. Uh, it's amazing how the, the computer's not the only technology that's changed at this time. When this was made, it was 16 millimeter film. That's what this was shot in. Then there was a period where uh, videotape dominated everything and pushed film aside. Videotape's gone and now it's all computer. So in my own field, it has become very computerized. If we're teaching film, our film program is all digital now, just about all digital. And the kids work at uh, computers to edit their films. And in teaching film, it's now very useful to me. And I've been doing that kind of rethinking that you're talking about much later than others. But because I can get the films on DVD, I can pre-code uh, and show kids just clips. You know, after the screening, I, if we want to look at a certain clip, we can find it very quickly, we can watch it. We can stream the video, the library helps us do that now. If I want a film that I can't show in class, but I want people to look at it, we stream it. They can look at it in the dorm. So gradually, it is, a, I think, improved film teaching a lot, because you can actually show clips I, I would add to that, you know, the discussion strands in English. I guess you take English classes and you um, you do a lot of, you have to post online. I don't know how to feel about that. I've tried it. i try it again and again. I don't really like it that much. Ultimately, what I like is sitting with a group of people and talking with them. And that may be backward, but what I feel for me, teaching as an English professor, is is inspired conversation in the flesh. And I just like seeing people. I like seeing the students. I like knowing the quirks of their personality. I like having them in the classroom. I like reading their papers. I can read them online, but I prefer them in hard copy. I don't know if that makes me a dinosaur or what, but I like people in the flesh. So. I don't need the computer to go a step on what you're saying, the computer is not going to, uh, the teacher has to enhance the education like uh, the woman over there said, 
the interaction with a professor talking to a student is what it's all about. The computer, it, it adds, it enhances the learning experience if you have the right curriculum. You know, it's just oh, we're moving toward a, a online education. I mean, how many of you are taking either hybrid or totally online courses? Do you like it? Thank you again for all of you.